Everyone has a right to education. According to UNESCO numbers, close to 100 million learners between the ages of 5 and 19 are out of school in sub-Saharan Africa. What exactly does this mean for a continent where the African Union has declared 2024 as the year of education? What do these numbers reflect on Africa's education system, its resilience, and also what are the opportunities for transforming our education to match the demand on the continent at the moment? Welcome to EdTech Mondays Africa. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. On a new season of EdTech Mondays, we are talking about investment in education for transformative learning. And I've got a panel of experts with us who are going to break down what this means for us on the African continent. Join me as we talk to these experts on what they think about investing in education in Africa. Allow me to introduce our panel of experts. We've got Nisi Madu, who is the managing partner at the Co-Creation Hub, and she also does take care of the iHub in Kenya. These are both technology hubs uh, based in Nigeria and Kenya. Thank you so much for joining us, Nisi. And we also have Krista Davidson, who is the executive director at Ingini in Cape Town, South Africa. And in studio, we do have Mr. John Kimoto, who is uh, an education expert and currently working with the EdTech Hub, that is an EdTech research global organization. Thank you so much for joining us. And to kick us off on this conversation, I would like to start with Nisi. You know, with all the investments that have been made in education, significant investments we've made in education across the African continent, what do you think have been the hits and misses so far? I think key thing I would describe as a hit was, you know, about five to eight years, 10 years back with investments in technology, which, you know, of course it was important as a way to go ensuring that the young people um, in schools are being equipped with the skills required to take on, you know, a digitally enabled future. Um, I think it was a hit as well as a miss as well in the ways that we um, thought that it could be valuable for learning in classrooms. So what we saw was setting up, you know, digital learning labs, which was great, but we then found that there's a lot more programming that has to happen to ensure that those investments can be maximized and that the, the, the devices as well provided in schools can be maximized as well. Great. Thank you. Krista, what are your thoughts around investments in education so far? I'd say that one example of a technology intervention that was poorly implemented and in retrospect, I think, has done a little bit of damage to the ed tech sector as a whole is the the One Laptop Per Child initiative, which gets a lot of a lot of press in the education community because it just really wasn't as thought through as it as it should have been and unfortunately burned many stakeholders in the process to to really feel like they should be taking risks on on technology in the classroom in the case of one laptop per child there were there were a number of challenges some of them related to sort of the lack of adaptation to local cultures to sort of the the maintenance of the actual devices um, the limited impact on learning itself, it didn't really demonstrate that the, the laptops could effectively enhance learning. There were, there were a lot of unfulfilled promises around the costs and, and sort of how these, these, this initiative would be rolled out over time. Unfortunately, a really inadequate focus on, on the social component, which we know is, is so vital to a successful education initiative. So that was one unfortunate myth, but I do think there have been some, some really great investments in education over the last few years. Outside of maybe technology specifically, if we think about the low-cost private school system in primarily East Africa, but you know, popping up more and more on the rest of the continent, there are of course some some pros and cons about how that system has sort of um, worked or not worked in in different contexts. But on the whole, it has made quality education more affordable to individuals who may not otherwise get access to to such sort of quality and relevant education. So. I think there's been a lot of a lot of progress and, and some learnings along the way. Fantastic. All right, uh, John, let me come to you. Um, in terms of education, you've led so many organizations in Kenya, uh, driving directions on curriculum, directions on content. What do you make of the investments in education so far? For me, I want to go back to 
how did education, the current education start in Africa? Mm -hmm. Because truly, there was education 200 years ago and even 500 years ago in Africa. But then in comes education from Europe and it started taking root. So I wish there was a way that we would have adopted as Africa from the education that was there, which was learner-centered, into the current education. But then there we were, Africa quickly took into that education that was brought to them. And many of the Commonwealth countries in Africa actually started by doing Cambridge form of education. You talk to the old folks older than me, they will talk to you about Cambridge examinations and the rest. And then you can see there were good hits because there was successful transition mm -hmm. from that which was learner-centered. But then here came an education that had a certain curriculum and a certain way of, that all of us must learn. And Africa was able to get into that. And you can imagine the kind of hits that Africa had to do. Infrastructure, classrooms, they were news to them. Teachers, they were news to them. They had instructors and mentors. And then all that came in and it was successful, but there are also some misses in how are we doing the investment? Were we doing it with a focus? Did we get national goals of education in place? And we kept on catching up on what are we missing then bringing it on board. Today, we are talking about Africa where we are thinking about the content of education, the curriculum itself. We are moving it to be learner-centered. We are moving it so that we are able to develop global citizens, not people who are only responding to our national goals of education, but also to the global goals of education and the sustainable development goals and the rest. So we are bringing in now a curriculum that will bring the learners to that speed. But then we are also thinking about the infrastructure that will bring that into place. That's where you see about connectivity into schools, mm -hmm. connectivity into teachers, changing the skills of the teachers and retouring them to be teachers who can do learner-centered learning. So those are the, some of the hits that we are getting through. And I would say the investment to me has been good. And even looking at from EdTech Hub, yes, we appreciate the kind of investment has, that has gone into education in Africa. But we also say we can do things better. If we had a certain way of focus that we are implementing, that we are not thinking about retro and NTech startups, we are thinking about an NTech startup that starts in Nigeria and is able to help the entire Africa. One starts in Kenya is able to help the entire Africa. If we think that way, then the investment we are putting will be more successful than the way we are putting it now. And that's why I want to appreciate what you told us about Africa Union focus. And speaking of uh, the focus, you know, there are areas that we think maybe would need more attention that we are not really paying attention to. And I guess that there is where uh, part of the problem is. What areas then do you think we need to prioritize in terms of investments in education? Krista, would you like to take us on first with this one? From where I'm sitting in South Africa, I'll, this will be a very sort of more South African centric um, response, but I think probably rings true elsewhere on the continent. So I think there are two big things that could use further investment and could make a, a really big impact. And the first is is teacher training and support. Um, there's there's a lot of sort of evidence that says a lot of our, our issues around education quality in South Africa and and I I believe the rest of of the continent really stems from the lack of training made available to our one of the most sort of undervalued professionals there is being being the teacher um, in South Africa alone I know we need. 25,000 new teachers each year. That's kind of the requirement to keep our, our learner to teacher ratio at a, a manageable um, figure. And unfortunately, only around 6,000 teachers are actually being trained annually. So, I mean, there's a huge difference there. And that really just means that we're suffering from a serious shortage of qualified teachers, which ultimately contributes to a learning crisis in the country. So, yeah, this has a knock-on knock effect. It means that we also experience a big sort of liter literacy crisis, a numeracy crisis. 
Um, we also know in South Africa that around only around 25% of mathematics teachers are actually actually sort of competent at the grade level that they're teaching. So, I mean, there, there are so many signals that, that we need to focus in on, on teacher training and making sure that teachers who are qualified or aren't and are trying to get there get the support that they need. So the other point that I'll just touch on very quickly is around school governance. And I think that's a, a trickier one and probably has a lot more to do with regulation and policy and might be a little bit more specific from country to country and even province to province, state to state. But um, I know in South Africa, we see the consequences of poor school governance in the way that the learning is, the education is delivered. So the poor management brings sort sort of brings corruption risks, which means that, you know, teachers aren't there when they're supposed to be there. The principal isn't really um, necessarily trained or qualified. There's not a lot of incentive for school leadership to improve. So a lot of sort of limited accountability and, and trust overall. So there's there's a lot that can be done to improve in those two areas. And of course, infrastructure is the other that gets kind of a lot of attention in this space and is still a challenge. But I believe, at least in South Africa, those two teacher training and school governance could go a really long way towards towards improving the situation. Um, Nisi, Nigeria is uh, the most populous nation on the continent. And, you know, by numbers, and also by demand for education, you know, but how do we build the resilience that could help us improve our education systems? At the point of systems, right, the education system and building system facing solutions that help ensure that one, we're able to monitor, evaluate, and understand that our children are learning in school. And then to Chris's point around school governance as well, from the very language level of, you know, a classroom all the way to the school level to perhaps local government level and to the state level and even to the federal level. How do we begin to look at how data from the classroom feeds across all of the systems? And then we're also able to have the kind of data that drives the effective decision to know how to allocate the resources um, that are available, whether they are spies or if we have to advocate for more funds within that space to make that. Um, and, and so that's one bit. There's also the bit around teachers as well um, and supporting teachers. There's this saying that if you have one really great teacher under a tree, they can make amazing learning happen. And so it's really thinking about what kind of support systems can we build around teachers, but how do we ensure that that's not a one-time thing? How do we ensure that it's continuous? Because the landscape of education the needs the children have and the needs in our in the modern job market and the contributions of their community and society is constantly changing. And right on the back of that as well to my last point is around equipping our young people. So they've gone through primary school, gone through secondary school, perhaps in some situations gone through tertiary education. But how do we equip them with skills that will need to thrive and be able to contribute um, you know, to the community and to the society at large? And so there are opportunities around how do we strengthen, in terms of all these other resilient systems, how do we strengthen our teammates, right? Because we know now that not all young people are going to go to tertiary education. How do we strengthen that? How do we strengthen that is ties closely to infrastructure. It's not just training them, but also providing the opportunity for the tools and resources they need to be able to start up their own business. Great, thank you. And I think actually you touched on something uh, that we were going to also highlight in terms of the momentum that we are building, you know, is this momentum sufficient for us to be able to prepare our young people for future jobs? But we'll be coming to that in just a moment. Uh, Mr. Kimoto, let me hear your thoughts around this. Um, the resilience of our education systems, can they withstand what anyone will call global education standards? Education has a product. And this product is the learner who is going to graduate through that education system. And that's the person we are looking at a holistic person who will also be resilient in a dynamic world that will be changing. Because the world is changing. Um, if I had time, I would go to the engineering of how the changes come about. But here we are, we are looking at content that will prepare this product so that eventually the product is able to withstand the changes and is going to be a global product. 
a product that is able to work like the way NEC is working in Nigeria and Kenya at the same time and all that. So this product then we are thinking about the content and how we are going to align it to the jobs that are there and the jobs that are going to come and jobs we don't even know. Now, for that to be derived, we come to what uh, our colleague from South Africa was talking about, starting discussing about the teachers, mm. that they must be skilled enough for this runner-centered learning process because all learners have the potential. It is us who are with the learners to make them realize their potential. Whether it is under inclusivity of the differently enabled learners, the ones who are slow learners, the ones who are fast learners, the innovators and everyone, they have their potential. So this teacher must be able to identify and be able to help the learner nurture that potential. So those are two elements, the content and then the teacher. And then look at that environment of delivering that content. And that's where the, our investment comes in. Is it the classroom or is it technology based and the rest? In order for this system to be resilient, in some tables that I sit in about edtech experts, we thought that it is actually the technology that will bring resilient education. But sooner than later, we realized it's actually the digital skills that are number one. And therefore, gap number one is digital skills. What are these frameworks that countries in Africa can be able to see that are contextualized to Africa to know that the technology you have is the best but you can go to a better one. And then to be able after contextualize like that, ensure that they are digital skills and then move those skills to have the resilient education. So it's a journey that has to be systematic, well organized so that each and every investment gets its value. I like that. Each and every investment gets its value. And of course, we've also seen a significant amount of fans that have been put into, uh, you know, edtech ventures across the African continent. Are we content at the solutions that we are seeing coming out of these um, ventures Afrocentric enough to drive the focus to education in Africa, getting better and getting to global standards? I think I want to start with uh, John on this one, and then we'll go around to Krista and, and then to Nisi. Yes, John. The investments are good. Uh, we, we can actually say we can celebrate this good investment in education, both by the governments themselves. And I want to say, even when we say it's under 20%, it's still a sacrifice to be able to put that amount of investment into education. Last year, I was in Innovations Africa and over 40 countries were there. And they were all showing commitment and the attitude was good, investing this way. But then we ask ourselves, are we really putting in the right way? Are we really matching this up with what we are getting from global partners in education, from other global support, from MasterCard Foundation and all those others? I think the best way is to have frameworks that are going to drive. And therefore the question is, is practice a hand of policy? If practice is a hand of policy then, we, the practitioners, need to help the policy makers develop that policy and have a framework that is going to guide us through. So the funding, I would say, is not the problem, but the way the, to journey through, the framework, the map to journey through, the kind of way that you don't have to repeat what another person is doing, that we can be able to merge and bring together, complement the various innovations that are coming through, that is what will help so that no learner will be left behind, the differently enabled, and all those are able to come through. I like the, the tone that he's set for this particular uh, question as well. Uh, are, we, are we seeing practice ahead of policy? And also, are we seeing similar innovations all across the board? How do we channel them into um, what exactly they're meant to achieve? Krista, let me hear your thoughts on this. Definitely. If we look at the rate of technological change, I mean, it would be impossible for policy to stay fully up to date with the evolution of, of technology and what that means for the education sector and many other sectors, to, to, be, to be fair. So, so of course, practice is, is ahead of policy in, in this case. 
I I think John is, is is spot on in saying that it is then up to the practitioner to inform that policy, but in turn, it's up to the policymaker to really listen to the practitioner and to engage meaningfully and, and to to hopefully come to some sort of agreement as to what the next best kind of a regulatory environment looks like to create this enabling atmosphere for innovation that is ultimately serving our learners. So yeah, I think there are some amazing opportunities in, in ed tech specifically, in education innovation more generally. Um, some have already been sort of demonstrated. I think the the ed tech companies that, that Nisi and I work with in our sort of respective tech hubs are all very much aware of the context in which they're operating in. These are sort of African-born innovations that understand the challenges that they're trying to solve for. And that's an important part of all of our screening processes when we're looking out for which opportunities we should be supporting with with resources and, and other kind of hands-on mentorship. So very important for sure. It's something that we don't take lightly. Um, and I think some of the, the numbers really speak for themselves in terms of the impact that some of those startups are beginning to have on the the learners that they're working with. You know, we can see a positive change in learning outcomes amongst some of these sort of end learners. And, you know, we're trying to to build that set of data more and more as a collective across the sort of EdTech Fellowship program in partnership with the MasterCard Foundation. So yeah, I think I think all of the signs are are positive in that innovation technology can really do a lot of good in the education space. Um, the regulatory environment needs to sort of get on board as well. All right. Um, allow me, um, you know, pose a follow-up question here. In 2023, you took on a number of innovators or a number of uh, developers as well. Um, tell us about the kind of impact that they had um, last year. So we worked with 12 South African ed tech companies over the course of 2023 with the support of the MasterCard Foundation playing a key role in, in the support that we delivered. And through just the the period that we were working really intensively with these companies, which was, you know, around seven months, we saw 2.3 million new learners, new South African learners come onto these platforms, get access to these educational tools. And I mean, reach doesn't necessarily indicate the impact, but it's it's a nice sign that we're doing something right and that learners are are seeing that there's an opportunity here that they can tap into um, and, you know, the the tools are resonating with them if they're willing to spend their time on an education platform when there's so much competition for their attention. You know, if we think about the TikToks and the Instagrams, to yeah. spare a few minutes of even, you know, an adult's time is is a big ask. Um, and so, so it's really, really, I think, heartwarming to think that these learners are acknowledging the importance of their own education and they're they're getting on board and using these tools for the betterment of their own their own sort of careers ahead. So some really, really promising data that we've begun to to collect. 2.3 million. That's a huge number. Imagine if that kind of investment went across all 55 African countries, the number of learners we'll be able to reach. Uh, Nisi, I want to hear your thoughts as well in terms of the ventures uh, on innovation in Africa, are they Afrocentric enough? What kind of impact are we seeing? Let me hear your thoughts around this. Seeing a lot of interesting solutions addressing key learning needs, both within Nigeria and in Kenya. Um, for the City Hub, implementing the Africa Foundation program in Nigeria, and implementing it as the Ad Hub in Kenya, um, with 24 of the startups who are working with, you know, they were able to reach about 1.3 million new learners. Um, and to Chris's point as well, it's exciting. It means that something is being done right, and you know, there's then that opportunity to dig deeper and you know, find and improve the solutions to be able to create impact and need to learn. But I also want to highlight an opportunity that this also provides, right? Um, an opportunity for us to deepen the investments coming into education and particularly at the on the continent. Um, that a lot of times these startups are building these solutions, one, to address a need, but also to ensure at the end of the day, a business and they need to stay up. But then there's an opportunity for us to balance and improve the kind of solutions that we're seeing and going beyond just, you know, test prep solutions or tutoring solutions, solutions that actually 
address specifically the apps building solutions in the system, basically error that we talked about earlier on the conversation that helps to provide the kind of data that can drive decision making and help maximize resources and best methods to education. To what Mr. Kimoto was saying about content that is contextualized, you know, focusing on foundational literacy in university, whether it's in STEM areas or even at the point of helping young people do the skills that they need. And to be able to start to unlock really exciting innovations in that space, there has to be that collaboration between practice and And because a lot of times we also find, you know, startup founders who build certain solutions and say, well, I wanted to test out the solutions, but we're not getting that opportunity. Um, or they assume <laughs> what, you know, public school systems or government might need. And, and that's where the collaboration really needs to happen for us to be able to unlock potential. But we bring all of the critical stakeholders to the room and we can have conversations about the kind of solutions we need, but not the solutions in the but also the use cases. How can we drive adoption for this to be able to see in terms of learning outcomes? And so in terms of our journey in EdTech on the continent, leveraging the funding and investment coming into it, I think that's where we're at at the moment, that collaboration and synergy between critical stakeholders to begin to unlock more exciting innovation that would help us see significant value in terms of learning. With that, I think, you know, I, I believe that, you know, the role of policy cannot be ignored. The role of partnerships cannot be ignored in making all of this happen, just like uh, John has mentioned. And I can see that you you really want to add to what Krista and uh, Nisi have shared on. You could touch on that briefly, and then we'll get into the year of education that has been declared by the African Union. A number of countries now, influenced by the people in education technology, have what we are calling policy academies. And those policy academies are doing well. Mm -hmm. Now I want to come to the startups. I have had a session, maybe three sessions, with the ones in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think we need to really ensure is there is that as they do the innovation, they have to remember learning is not learning until they are learning outcomes. And out learning outcomes are usually measured in assessments. Assessments are changing from the summative assessment to continuous assessment and assessment for purpose of learning. And there comes the big data and artificial intelligence. So your startups must ensure in whatever they are doing, these two are coming into place. So that eventually they become the futuristic innovations that we are looking, at, looking for. They also need to have a voice. They finished their work, their, their startup journey, and they go in their different directions. No one remembers the other. But we need to create a voice for them that will now become influential in the policy academy. And that we then, we are able to have even innovations in the innovations. They start at 12, as 12. How many are able to merge in their thinking and come up with even a better one, which is merged? So there are those things that we need to bring in into the innovation world to make it better than it is now. We are already good, but we can do better. We're already good, but we can do better. And that, that, that's, the, that's the very point I want to even bring in, the fact that this is the year of education, or at least according to uh, the African Union. And, you know, when the African Union says they've declared 2024 as the year of education, so people will ask, what does that even mean? Uh, does this mean we've not paid attention to education before? Um, and if we have, you know, what are we seeing as being um, further investments that we are going to witness on the African continent? Because as is, most African countries actually pay no more than 18% of their national budgets or dedicate no more than 18% of the national budgets to education. So what is going to change? What kind of paradigm shift are we likely going to see now that the African Union is paying attention uh, to education? Nisi, where do you think this paradigm shift is going to come from? It's interesting to have this year become the year of education. Um, I, one thing I do not underestimate is the power of focus and intentionality, especially when you know it's agreed that this is what we're focusing on. So in terms of a paradigm shift or perspective, I think that will change with this focus. It's around the intentionality with which we actually measure learning outcomes. So it's not just enough to say there's a number of education initiatives we're implementing, or these are the number of children were getting into schools, 
I mean, we've moved beyond just those numbers and we need to go to more impactful metrics around learning outcomes. So when our children are in the classrooms learning, what are they learning? You know, can they demonstrate that, you know, they have been able to acquire the skills or have been able to acquire this learning? And so that's a, that's a perspective, I think, that will shift thinking more critically about how we monitor and evaluate the learning um, that happens within classrooms. And perhaps to what Mr. Kimoto was also saying, actually leveraging technology should then be able to help us do that effectively. Going to assessment informed instructions to able to ensure um, assessment-based instructions rather, to be able to ensure that our teachers in the classrooms are more effective and more productive. Because we do know a lot of the challenges, I would say, that plague you know, education in Africa, whether it's the teacher-to-student ratio. How do we begin to say, when we have that teacher in the classroom, we're able to maximize the teacher's productivity, support them with the tools and resources to ensure that learning is actually happening. So for me, as I was going to move beyond nice to have metrics to must have metrics that actually help us know that learning is taking place. Nice to have metrics to must have metrics. Krista, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree completely with Nisi. I, I don't think I could have said it better myself. Maybe I'll just add that I, I really hope that this year brings a bit more alignment across stakeholders. I think there is still a mismatch in understanding as to what the key priorities are in individual countries and in provinces and communities from a sort of government level compared to the understanding from you know, a citizen or, or private sector. And so that results in a mismatch of, of resources that are allocated to those challenges and you know, not a whole lot of cohesion in terms of a strategy and, and a way forward. So I hope that this year brings that focus that Nisi was speaking about from a data perspective, but also from, you know, what exactly are we hoping to achieve by the end of this this period? What's what's the real goal? How are we going to progressively realize the targets that have been set in the sustainable development goals relating to quality education? You know, there are a lot of, of big indicators that, that we're interested in improving upon and by all measures, we're, we're certain we're not very close to to making those targets. So, you know, like what's the priority, and how can we get everyone involved who needs to be involved on board and focused on the same things? Great, um, John. I know you have a lot to say about this one, um, but in terms of where we're at, can we tie that to the fact that we've got a number of vulnerable populations or disadvantaged populations across the African continent? And in line with the African Union's goals for the year 2024, um, do you think that there is a place for partnerships and investments where improving the situation of the most vulnerable learners are concerned? I like the theme of the African Union, and I just hope that it is going to pick at certain thematic areas to be able to address, so that as countries we can ask ourselves, how are our vulnerable learners being treated? Have we paid enough attention to the disadvantaged, to the people who are in conflicts? Have we paid enough attention so that if countries are able to ask that, then there can be conversations and even inter-country exchanges on how we have been able to handle our case, then our neighbor can handle the case the same way or even a better solution to that. Mm. That even after we do that, we can go into harmonization of our even educational content so that it becomes easy. If we do harmonization, it means that the regions yeah. would be able to support each other mm -hmm. and be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. And then ask ourselves, who are these partners who are partnering with our neighbor? How can we be able to extend that? If we have ways of handling our bright learners in Kenya, in Nigeria, then how can we handle them across? That being the year of education, and if it is able to address that, then it will be very good. I'm just hoping that the year will end up with a resolution of what we thought five years ago of having an Africa education campus. Just like the way you have the online learning campus in the World Bank where you go and find courses. 
then this we thought the Africa Education Campus would be able to help even policy makers when they come on board mm -hmm. and education, uh, um, a country administration has changed, there are new people, they can go there and take courses that would change their attitude, that would make them understand where are we coming from and where are we going. And that kind of harmony then can make us pull together as Africa, as one, and be able to be even that provider of human resource manpower in the next 10 years, because it will be Africa. And indeed, it will be Africa. And, and when we talk about the future, because when we're talking about investment in education, we're not just saying it for a year or two. We're also thinking about uh, you know, the kind of future that we are likely going to see. Um, the result of this investment will come out or will show up in the kind of youth uh, that will produce ready for the market. But, you know, is there sufficient momentum in education that you're seeing happening across uh, learning institutions that could probably even give some sense of direction on the kind of young people we are likely going to see in the future in terms of readying them for the modern job market? John? I think even when you see in a game you play and you are playing very well, then you ask for timeout so that you can be able to see how do I really organize this to a winning game. Yeah. I think African Union is also calling us for that time out, to be able to just a moment ask ourselves where are we going? What is this labor that is needed? If we are told that one third of population, young people are in Africa and they will be the people who will be serving the world in the next 10 years, then what are these skills that we need to prepare early enough? Like we educate and digital skills. What are these skills that we need to prepare early enough? Are we organized enough in each and every country to prepare our citizens for that? I think that's the time out to be able to say, let us organize, let's have the frameworks, let us learn from each other, let us be harmonized towards having that skilled human resource that will be able to serve the world from Africa. A skilled human resource that will be able to serve the world from Africa. Krista, uh, I know Nisi had touched on uh, the role of Tibets in making all of this happen, but I want to hear your thoughts around this in terms of the momentum in education to equip Africa's young people for the modern day job market. There certainly is some momentum. I think, you know, there are several large scale initiatives that are focused on this objective, as well as NPOs and, and technology startups, all really recognizes, recognizing the crisis that we're experiencing with with youth unemployment and, and all of the, the other issues that come with it. So I think it's definitely something that is top of mind for, for many practitioners and those of us who are really trying to, to sort of innovate on the ground. Um, however, I think it is also quite clear that many initiatives are intervening a bit too late. And just to come back to sort of what those skills really are and my prior comments and some of the other, the other discussion points around the pace of change in the market, but more generally in technology, you know, we can't be equipping individuals with skills that are super specific and, you know, attached to relevant jobs right now. We don't know what jobs are going to look like in the next year and, you know, definitely not in 10 years time. So we need to be preparing learners to be adaptable, to be critical thinkers, to be problem solvers, to be prepared to change with technology and to sort of tackle whatever that future looks like. So I think there's just, there's a lot of value in equipping learners with transferable skills rather than focusing them in on something like, you know, a coding language that might be relevant today, but obsolete tomorrow. So I think there's just something to be said about ensuring that we're not skilling youths based on the realities of today. Absolutely. Nisi? I think for me, the area I want to focus on is um, there's the opportunity of training them on, around the transferable skills as well as the technical skills. Um, but I think that we also have to create opportunity for them to be able to test out the skills, right? To build on the job expertise um, as well, not just the training opportunities that we go and so there's a huge opportunity for us to, I think, it's a for the matching internships, graduate internships, or job shadowing opportunities for young, um, or, you know, continent to be able to then build the skills post training or even as a subset of you know the training that we provide. 
because at the end of the day, it's great for us to do all of this beautiful work, but if that expertise isn't available and in a way for them to quickly build it, then the jobs that do not exist or even the jobs that are available now that will try to prepare them for, they might not be able to take advantage of it. And that also gives us the opportunity again for that collaboration and partnership between practitioners and also corporate and private sector organizations who say, these are the skills that we need now, these are the skills we might need in the future. How do we begin to build that pipeline? And not just within the continent, but also, you know, outside the continent as well. And as we bring this conversation to a close, I just wanted us to each take a minute and share our parting shots in terms of what now needs to be done. How do we move the needle forward and how do we contribute to making this investment in education happen or this year of education um, just perform as much as the expectations from both the African Union and from the organizations that we lead at the different levels that we're at? Uh, Krista, let me start with you. You know, it's an exciting time, actually. There there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of sort of hurdles to overcome. But ultimately, I think with alignment and with focus, as we've spoken about, a lot can be achieved in a short period of time. Um, education, of course, is a long journey and we may only see the results of those efforts, the efforts that we put in today, many years down the line. But I think it's it's safe to say that the effort will be worth it. And if we are sort of working in a, in a way that is is cohesive and, and targeted, um, we'll see some change eventually. So it's, I, I'm optimistic about the future. I think with partnerships and, and data and all the things that we've discussed today, we stand a really good chance of overcoming some of these, these wicked problems. Can you see? There's something called a not star, which is essentially what you keep your sights on and helps you, you know, achieve your goal no matter how turbulent the journey might be. I think that for us and, and our focus on, on education this year, you know, I think that learning outcome should be our And every single thing that we do begins to say help us question how we assess and talk about learning outcomes that we want to see, what sort of solutions that we're building, leveraging technology to be able to make that happen. What are the critical stakeholders that we need to work with to be able to achieve this learning And so my parting words are, Let's make learning outcomes that are not start with this year and be very intentional about, you know, seeing that happen. John? Our attention must remain on the product of education, that learner. And our attention must also remind ourselves that that product of education is not a product for today, but for that future, that when we look at the alignment of the content of learning, when we look at the skills that we need to put in place, must be looking at a product of education that will be very dynamic, that will be able to scale and reskill and reskill again into that future that we don't know. That's the product that we need to keep our attention on, all of us. Harmonize, align, and ensure that because one particular specialist is not enough. We need many of them. And that's why we need to also harmonize so that we have a product out of education that all of us are proud of. Right. Um, a product that all of us can be proud of. I mean, uh, looking at learning outcomes as our North Star. And then also Krista talked about, you know, the relevance. We need to focus on relevance uh, of the education to make sure that it impacts our learners. I mean, just even listening to the numbers uh, in terms of how much impact has been created, where focus has been placed on innovation and seeing the reach that it's been able to achieve, I think that in itself should um, serve as another North Star that, you know, where focus is placed on innovation uh, in education, a lot can change. And I'd like to believe that um, as experts of education and technology, I'm sure the African Union should be looking into this conversation and saying that there is exactly what we need to do. So thank you all so much for making this conversation happen. And what a way to start off our season on EdTech Mondays Africa for this year, investment in education for transformative learning. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for making time to be on the show. Krista Davidson, Executive Director at Ingenie Technology Hub in South Africa uh, that is based in Cape Town, and also Nisi Madhu, Managing Partner at Co-Creation Hub 
and also managing partner at the iHub, CC Hub in Nigeria and iHub in Kenya. And of course, uh, Mr. John Kimoto, who is an education expert in Kenya and across the African continent, and also is currently serving as an education and technology expert at the education or EdTech Hub, that is a global EdTech research organization. Thank you all so much for making time for us. And I guess with that, we've come to the end of the conversation. And until the next edition of EdTech Mondays, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.